thank you everyone for coming, whoever's come. Uh, and uh, thank you, Mayan and, and uh, Lincoln, for, for coming all the way to Bombay. Um, when Bachi and Amita came up with this idea of having uh, water as the theme uh, for the, this year's Lit Fest, uh, the first person I thought of was Lincoln, because you know Lincoln was here in Bombay about two and a half years back, and I had just started reading his book, uh, the, the Sea and Civilization, uh, and it was, I was totally fascinated you know, by such a wide-ranging and accessible book that sort of turned your perspective around away from land-based history to uh, maritime history. So I said the first person we have to get is, is Lincoln, and just at that time, um, uh, Maya's book had, had, had come out, the reviews had started coming out for the Dawn Watch, and again, you know, it's, sometimes you have a book where you, can, where, where you read the theme and you say, oh my God, what a wonderful idea. And for anybody who's read Conrad, and as I was just telling Maya, those of us who grew up, you know, about 30 years back, pre-television, we did actually read writers like Conrad. Um, and the idea of using Conrad as a prism with which to look through globalization and, and, the, and, and the growth of our current world just seems, seems, such, a fascin uh, seems such a fascinating one. Um, both these writers would be having in-depth sessions on their books. I'll be doing the session with Lincoln uh, t tomorrow. So, you know, we, uh, there'll be a chance to go more deeply into their books. Um, today's session, though, is going to be talking about pirates. Um, and if you're coming, if you're here, you know, hoping to look, uh, you know, from perspective of pirates of the Caribbean and, you, and, and that sort of like romantic history, well, not so much. <laughs> But we are going to look at pirates as a way of looking at, you know, the sort of maritime world as a sort of, as you said in your opening speech, a liminal space, you know, a, a, a somewhere that's always on the margins where different things can happen, different ways of living can be, can, can, can be um, explored. So I'm going to start by asking you a very basic question. Uh, what is a pirate? How do you define what a pirate is? Well, the, the classic definition actually goes back to um, Cicero, uh, the Roman orator, and he defined a pirate as the common enemy of all mankind. So these are not people who work on behalf of institutions or governments necessarily, um, but they are just, they're basically criminals of the sea. And uh, for reasons that are steeped in historical um, precedent, they've always been treated differently from criminals on land. Um, but basically, the, the thing to remember about pirates is that they are distinct from, say, uh, privateers who actually work within a legal framework developed by Europeans in the late medieval, early modern period. They're different from corsairs, uh, which we understand from or know from the Mediterranean in the um, early modern period up through the 19th century. Um, they're, they are analogous, or I think it is another word for buccaneers, uh, who are the people who roamed the Caribbean. Um, not like Johnny Depp roams the Caribbean. Um, but uh, so they are, they're out and out criminals. And they operate on the margins of society, um, organized society. Uh, they are not inherently bad people but they are people without a country normally and people without opportunity. And but, that's certainly the, the situation we have today. But, you know, if looking at the definitions of pirates, it seems that it's a quite a loose definition. Uh, you know, my, one of my favorite stories about piracy, which I can tell because Maya's from Harvard, and this involves Yale. Uh, and this is, this is a story from Chennai where I grew up, where Elihu Yale was the governor of, of, of Madras. And there is this one story um, about how one of his grooms borrowed, you know, st borrowed or stole one of his horses and went off for like a, a sort of joyride. And in doing so, crossed the river, the Adia River. And Yale, who was a pretty nasty piece of work, all said and done, uh, you know, when the guy came back, had him imprisoned and wanted to have him, uh, wanted to have him executed. And, but you know, even the governor of, of Madras couldn't have somebody executed just like that. So Yale charged him with piracy. Because he said I took a, he took a stolen uh, property, the horse, across a body of water, and that made him a pirate. So you know that's an, ex an example of how sort of basically a pirate seems to be somebody doing something you don't like involving water. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but also, I think in the history of uh, of, of, of piracy, 
Um, a lot of pirates have been sometimes pirates, sometimes mercenaries linked to countries. Uh, you know, you know that, that def the definition between a, a pirate, a privateer, seems to have been fairly f flexible, right? Well, I think it, it's uh, basically piracy is a, um, it's a crime of opportunity. And if you have the opportunity to work within a legal framework or with the support or cover of a government, then chances are pretty good that you will uh, refrain from piracy and work within that, that framework. Yeah, but I mean, what, what again seems to be interesting about the idea of privacy is that it both seems to defy nationhood and also define nationhood in, in some extent, you know? Because uh, what, what, across the, I, I, if I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, but there are stories of how, you know, countries' naval efforts get formed in the battle against piracy, like the, the, the United States, right, had a very early engagement. Well, there's also the question, and I'd be uh, interested for you to help explain for me the differences between piracy and privateering. Well, that I know, but Corsairs, for instance. Uh, because there's the argument that's been made that the British Empire in the Caribbean, for example, was largely built on the back of piracy uh, as different uh, British privateers, and among others, but are they counted as pirates by their enemies or not, I don't know, um, ended up basically busting into the Caribbean empires that had already existed under the French and the Spanish. Uh, and I think one of the features of, of early modern empire building that um, we uh, sometimes forget to our peril is that most early modern empires were built um, by uh, raiders and uh, people who were uh, uh, launching incursions into right. pre-existing empires. Right. So you can see the British, in a sense, as being the pirates of the Caribbean, building their empire there. And right. then later, as you say, in the uh, early years of the 19th century, the United States, at that time a new nation, um, made one of its uh, first most conspicuous uh, overseas ventures in a campaign to eradicate uh, uh, the Corsairs, the Barbary pirates, as, as we call them in North Africa. Uh, and it's uh, in so this who, that who, the... Who were the Corsairs, the Barbary Corsairs? They were just the North African... Well, there was... <laughs> There are uh, there were there were several states in North Africa which were nominally tributary to the Ottoman Empire, um, Algiers, uh, Tunis, and uh, in Tripoli in particular, and to a lesser extent Morocco, which had its own was more or less independent. It was actually one of the first countries to have a treaty with the United States. Um, what people, particularly in the United States, forget is that the reason that we went to war with Tripoli was because we had agreed to pay tribute to the Tripolitans in order to um, avoid being attacked by their ships. And we reneged on our, our commitment. And so they took our ships, which is a perfectly legitimate thing to do. Now we may say, oh, well, that's terrible behavior. They should never have threatened to take the ships. But this was the system that the Europeans had worked up in concert with the, um, the uh, the bays and days of North Africa for centuries. And one of the things that they like to do is up the ante so that if the British or the French, uh, who had lots of resources, they could um, pay and uh, buy protection, uh, but say the Danes and the Dutch uh, might not have enough money to, to pay protection. And the United States didn't have much protection. And they were forced to, uh, they American sailors had sailed under the cloak and protection of the British flag until independence. And so we had slipped into this, um, this system uh, knowing full well what was expected of us and uh, then reneged. And so the Tripolitans uh, went to war and then the Americans got very uh, hepped up and decided to go um, put an end to this. But in fact, uh, you know, legally speaking, uh, the Tripolitans were in the right. It's another of these lessons of empire. On the one hand, uh, empires are often built on the backs of others in the way the British did in the Caribbean, but the other thing is that empires like to move in and say that they're doing right when in fact they're often uh, uh, turning uh, their own sort of problems into their own advantage, as yeah. is the case with, the, with this uh, incursion in North Africa. Uh, but to this day, it's the US Marines song, isn't it? And it involves uh, to the shores of Tripoli. Yeah, well, that's, which, that's, that's, that's where the song comes from. Yes, it does. Yes. Yeah, it, yeah, it's, yeah. Um, there were about six Marines they didn't get anywhere near Tripoli. Um, it's 
Well, it's a lot of things. It's a great example of imperial propaganda. Yes, it's a great example. Um, also, the halls of Montezuma. Montezuma was never confronted by an American of any kind. <laughs> right. Um, but but uh, just to stay into, uh, stray into Pirates of the Caribbean territory for, the, for, for, for a minute, um, you know, was it true that there were sort of pirate constitutions, that the pirates saw themselves as a sort of maritime, you know, empire, uh, not, not empire, so as a sort of alternative to nationhood? Well, I... I or is that romanticized? I, I don't think it's romanticized. I think it's a little overblown. Um, and Marcus Redeker and um, others have done an enormous amount of work looking at the sort of the egalitarian uh, the history from below of, of pirates and, and other mariners. But a, a point I want to come back to that Maya made about the, you know, the way piracy operated in the Caribbean, um, yes, the English were piratical and did raid and, and sort of the Spanish and sort of the French, everybody's territory, up until the, I, I forget which treaty it was, um, at which point they all sort of combined forces and said, actually, uh, there's enough trade going on here, we don't want piracy, and they conspired to basically end piracy uh, right off the bat. And um, that sort of brought an end to the, the, pirate, the golden age of piracy, uh, which is a, a terribly tacky name uh, for people who were really not very nice. I, I think it's, um, it's interesting to see that piracy has been so romanticized in, in recent years, decades, and I think the analogy that comes to mind for me, I wonder if this works for you, is Robin Hood, who uh, we associate with a kind of popular justice, uh, and it's the, it's the reinvention of a criminal figure as a folk hero, right. and there's an extent to which pirates have had that uh, reinvention in the popular imagination, uh, but I think, as you suggest, that it may be a little bit overblown yeah. to suggest that these were figures who were somehow upholding uh, a, a, a kind of people's commonwealth or something right. like that. Um, the other thing that I think is worth stressing in the context of the Caribbean is that the time at which piracy um, fades out or is suppressed is also the time at which the transatlantic slave trade right. steps up massively. Right. Uh, and I, I don't know of sort of direct relationships between these, but I'm sure that they are very much uh, connected. Uh, and the kinds of, uh, the, the, the sort of idea of the pirate capturing the, the ship laden down with treasure sort of gives way in an era when the treasure, quote unquote, that's being taken as human captives for the right. sugar plantations. Right. Well, I think it, it speaks to the fact that, um, that the reason that the British and the French in particular wanted to um, eradicate piracy was that they did have the, the beginnings of a very stable economy yes. and the slaves were needed to make that economy flourish. Exactly, it's the transition from the, the sort of extractive empire right. of the Spanish into right. the agricultural commercial yeah. empire of the British but, and the French. But I wonder if there are seeds of things in the sort of pirate myth which do reflect something essential about uh, how the maritime world has been conducted. Um, you know, for instance, uh, one thing I've got from both your books is about how diverse the crews on ships have always uh, been. You know, for instance, you, you talk in your book about uh, the myth of the Portuguese as a maritime nation, when in fact, actually, very few Portuguese were, were, actually, involved, uh, were actually involved on the ships. And the, the, crew, the, port, the crews on the Portuguese ships were actually uh, quite diverse. And similarly, you know, when you, when you talk about Conrad actually sailing to Southeast, uh, to, to, to Southeast Asia, um, the, uh, there is so much diversity. I mean, for instance, one thing I never knew until I read your book was that the, sh the ship that he sails to Malaysia was actually owned by a Muslim, uh, which, is, which, is, which is fascinating. It makes me wonder if a you know, strong, you know, proud Englishman would have, would have well, you know, signed up onto a ship owned by a Muslim. But Conrad, as a deracinated Polish uh, uh, you know, uh, Pole, uh, was, was, was more willing to, to and, and the others were Scots, again, a sort of marginal country. So they, there does seem to have been this huge diversity, right, of, uh, of people actually working on ships. For sure. I mean, I think the maritime world is a world of diversity, no matter when you, when you look at it. And right. uh, maritime cities, of course, are, are one of the, uh, one of the, 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 the hallmarks of that. Um, ships sail under a flag right. and give you therefore the impression that it is a national ship, but you need only look at the shipping registers of 
today's maritime world to see how completely um, disconnected the flag of the vessel may be from anyone on board the ship. And all of this is, has deep, deep roots uh, historically and also legally, right. where it is in many ways very helpful for shipping companies right. to be able to register a vessel in one place, flag it in another, have a, have a captain of one nationality, a crew of others. Um, and I think that it, I mean, I'd be, I'd be interested for, for your take on this as well, but I think that, you know, if you look in the, in, in maritime uh, realms of the world, such as the East Indian archipelago, or, or for that matter, uh, Atlantic Europe, you find that uh, any kind of maritime um, community, the, the the people on the on the littoral and the people who are serving on the ships may have more to do with each other than the people inland in those countries. You know, so so you'll find, for example, that that certain Scots might have more to do with people in, say, Antwerp than they might with people in in Kent. You know? Can I ask? You know, for your for your book, you actually traveled on a container ship. Uh, across across the Indian Ocean, uh, what was the crew like? Well, that was a fascinating voyage. Um, so I hope we'll have a chance to talk more about container shipping. But I, perhaps the first and most central point to, to stress is that even though we today like to think of ourselves as living in a you know sort of world of digital commerce and communications and so on, we actually depend on maritime. Uh, commerce more today than at any point in world history. Right. Uh, so 90% of everything that we have it travels by sea and, and these vast container ships are going back and forth all the time. Uh, the vessel that I was on was a French ship and it was actually flagged to France, which is, uh, it was owned by a French company but flagged to France. The, the officers were all French, but the crew were overwhelmingly Filipino, another of these populations that has a long standing connection yeah. with the sea and that you'll find uh, yeah. on board many ships. Uh, and there was one Indian crew member, in okay. fact, who was a painter. Uh, and they said to me, oh, all the painters on our ships are Indians. So there's a kind of sense of kind of hierarchies. I think it has to do with pay, levels of pay. Right. It has to do with the recruiting and manning agencies that these right. people are coming from. Uh, and there was that very sharp divide between the officer class and the crew, which is certainly something you would have seen, I think, throughout the ages. Right, right. Lincoln, is, is it true, I mean, that, you know, crews have always been so diverse? I mean, you hear talk about Laskars. Who were Laskars? Well, Laskars were Asian seamen from the Indian Ocean region who, by law, weren't actually allowed west of the of Cape Town. Um, so, you know, the British were willing to will deal with them, but not that willing. Um, the, uh, one of the things that um, England did, particularly starting in 1650 and later was followed by the United States, was uh, to have these navigation laws. And the navigation laws stipulated that in order to fly the uh, flag of Britain, a certain percentage of the crew had to be English, because this was obviously a problem. Um, and English, I guess, would have meant anywhere in the British Isles. But if you look at these, um, there, there have been some fascinating studies done, particularly at the Dutch East India Company, where they've looked at the, where the, the places of origin of the, the crews and people shipping out in Dutch East India Company ships to Southeast Asia, and they come from all over Europe. France, uh, Germany, Spain, Italy, um, and, and you can see these beautifully done maps which show the sort of scatter plots of where they're, they're from. So this diversity of, of um, origin is something very old, and you also find it, uh, even if you look at, uh, say, Egyptian hieroglyphs from 3,000, 4,000 years ago, uh, you see uh, people dressed in different ways uh, on the same ship. You also find in archaeological settings in the Mediterranean uh, a diversity of origin for um, goods and people and uh, religions so, um, and language. So this is, yes, ships have always been sort of a place where, for whatever reason, people sort of gravitate to them perhaps uh, because it's the only opportunity they have, but also perhaps because they're trying to get away from wherever they're from. L like, Conrad, like Conrad, I think, yeah. I think Conrad himself is a fascinating example of that. I mean, uh, he's, he is this Pole, you know, whose father is deeply tied to the idea of Polish nationalism and, you know, its suffering and oppression by, by Russia. And suddenly he decides that his way out of all this is to just go to the, is, is to go to the sea. 
but it wasn't that easy for him, right? I mean, he had to, even when he lands up in Marseille, he finds he can't actually get onto a ship. Well, it's, first of all, relatively difficult to run away to sea when you live in a landlocked country. So that was one thing that he had to get around, uh, which he did, as you say, by going to Marseille because he spoke French fluently and had some connections there. Uh, but I, I think there's a moment later on in his career when he's coming for an exam or something and the examiners say that you're a Pole. I mean, what is a Pole doing? It's, 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 yeah, I mean, it's a pretty unusual, uh, yeah. unusual thing to find, uh, at least at that time. Um, so, uh, when he goes to France, however, he runs into one of the issues that, that you mentioned, which is that uh, different uh, nations might have restrictions on the number of foreign people on board their ships, and above all, in the case of Conrad, the French said that if you uh, were a subject of various other powers, you needed to have their consular permission in order to sign on. Conrad was at the time a subject of the Russian Empire and would have needed consular permission to work on a French ship. Now, one of the reasons, by the way, for this stipulation is that the merchant marine is de facto the naval reserve for many nations at this time, because you don't, um, unlike an army where you might maintain a standing army uh, up to a point, and also unlike an army where you can train people pretty quickly in how to fire a gun, uh, to work on a ship takes a fair amount of training and you're not going to be maintaining a standing navy in the way that you're maintaining a standing army. So they needed in times of war to be able to mobilize experienced seamen and that meant getting them off of merchant ships. So if you had a merchant marine in which a very high percentage of the people working in it were not your nationals, then that could be very difficult in a, in a time of war. So anyway, so Conrad runs into this problem in that context and it's one reason he ends up in the British uh, service instead. Right, right. So now I'm just going to jump ahead to the one point where I think both your books interact in a really interesting way. Um, one of the themes that, 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 that comes through your book is about a time of transition. Because Conrad joins, or at least he thinks he is joining, in an age of sail. Because you know, you know all the stories he's read about going, going, to, to, going to sea are set in sail. But the reality is he pretty much joins at a point of transition when you are moving from, from, from sail to steam. And that's a huge change. And Lincoln, can you tell us a little bit about that? What did the transition to steam mean for the maritime world? Well, the, the, the most important thing was that there was a, a guaranteed reliability of, and we plan to get there on you know, two Mondays hence, and they could do that. And you can actually follow uh, very easily the uh, progress in terms of speed crossing the Atlantic, you know, 14 days, very, very rapidly. So that was one advantage. The second, um, and, and that's the advantage to the shippers. And there's always this, um, this problem, I think, in, in, among maritime historians and others who, you know, they, they sort of, they look at the maritime world through this somewhat romantic prism, and I think Conrad is guilty of this as well. They don't look at it from the point of view of the shippers, who don't care about tradition, and they don't, they care about making profits. That's their business. Ships are just a vehicle. They don't care what kind of ship it is. They just want to have stuff get there safely and on time, and, and quickly. Um, so that was a big transition. Um, and if I could say a little bit more about this transition, because Maya's yeah. book talks a lot about Conrad's sort of affection for sail and the sort of the metaphor of, you know, this lost age of innocence or whatever. And what, what Conrad and so many other maritime historians who romanticize the last days of sail forget is that, you know, basically the entire slave trade took place under sail. They forget that the coolie trade, which was happening when Conrad was, uh, was at sea, took place under sail in conditions that Booker Washington, who had been a slave, compared to slavery itself. Um, you had the whole practice of Shanghai, which was basically getting people drunk, blind drunk, in bars and then dragging them onto your ships so that you would have enough crew to San Francisco to Shanghai and to other ports. Uh, so there's this, this tendency, I think, to look at the last days of sail in this very sort of misty-eyed way that to me makes no sense because right. they're, the, the English and the Americans in particular, who are really the people who wrote about this the most, you know, sort of make a virtue out of misery. And in so doing, kind of recruited people to this capitalist enterprise to the benefit of the capitalists and nobody else. You don't find the same thing in France at the same time, 
uh, because the French actually operated on a bounty system. So actually do, do, going do, to see was a fairly... Do you think it's true that, that Conrad had this romantic yeah, idea of I sale? Yeah, I mean, he, he certainly had a romantic idea of sale, and the points about slavery and coolies are well taken, although, of course, Conrad writes about that as not slavery, but he does about the coolie trade, and he also talks about one important transition that happens alongside the transition to steam, which is mass migration, and the degree to which he has a very moving story called Amy Foster, in which uh, uh, an immigrant is taken from Central Europe thinking that he's going to be going to the United States and is sort of thrust into the bowels of a, a steamship and, and sort of deposited in a wreck on the, on the shores of England and doesn't know where he is and so on. Um, so, so, I mean, I think that the question of um, forced traffic is one that continues even into the age of steam. I, the interesting point that I wanted to come back to that you raised is the thing about, um, is the thing about how it's better for the shippers to have the steamships, which of course it is. And I think that what's uh, interesting in the uh, transition from sail to steam and the romanticization of sail is that you see Conrad and these figures like him uh, exalting a form of essentially what we could consider artisanal labor in the face of what they see as industrial proletarianization. And I guess that for me what's um, striking in thinking about this is that the nostalgia for the age of sale may overlook some of the forms of um, uh, abuse capitalism in that form uh, uh, and uh, 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 forced labor and so on of the, of the uh, pre-mechanized uh, age, and yet the, uh, the, the, the kind of increasing uh, uh, emphasis that's placed on speed and, and, and profit and all of that kind of thing, of course, ushers in an age of a different type of capitalism, the one that we would associate much more with sort of today's multinational capitalists and, of global capitalism and actually is tied to, if you look at, say, containerization, is tied to uh, the uh, sweatshop labor and so forth that's happening all over the world. So, I mean, the sea is always, I guess what I would say is that the sea is always related to various forms of inequality and uh, forced labor. And the question is, where Blame is that the taking ocean. place? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm not blaming the ocean. I'm blaming the people who are on the ocean. <laughs> I, I'm curious. You know, the, 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 the ship that he sails to uh, Malaysia, uh, what was the name? The, uh, the, uh, you have this detail in your book where you, where you say that, you know, looking at the history of that ship, it was almost definitely involved with, with, uh, with, yeah, with, yeah. with contraband, yeah. with guns, yeah, yeah. With, with possibly with slavery. Yes. But was Conrad un unaware of all that? Oh, I don't think he was unaware of it at all. Okay. I think he didn't necessarily want to talk about some of that, okay. but I'm sure he was aware of it. Yeah. Right, 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 right. So, 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 uh, so, so let, 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 let's. You, you talked about container ships yeah. and 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 the, and and the world we're in today, um, where which we see a bit, you know, in in Conrad about about moving towards trade, about this shipping on an entirely. Uh, 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 different scale. Sorry, w w w w one question, which I think you talk about in your book, is how did this, this, the, the the shift to steam change the composition of, of the crew? Um, so, for instance, for the first time, you now have engineers on the ship, right? And you don't have, you don't no longer need sailmakers or so, a thing like that. So, the, the composition of, of sailors like changed, right? Well, yes. Instead of sailors uh, going aloft, as, as you say in the book, uh, you had. Um, the sailors working in the stokeholds, which were, you know, unbelievably hot, very dangerous, uh, continually feeding these furnaces to keep the ships going. Um, and they were also filthy, so they weren't very good for passengers either. And you had steamships, coal-fired steamships up until the, you know, middle of the, of the 20th century, and there's actually there's a wonderful book about you know what to do if you're going on a long distance voyage by by ship, and um, one of the pieces of advice is if you're wearing a white suit, never stand to win leeward because you'll get coal ash all over you. Um, you know, helpful things to know. So there was that um, navigation took uh, be became uh, somewhat different. Uh, particularly as advances in, in radar and sonar and DECA and Loran and GPS. All of those things have been a consequence of, you know, further developments in the, in the world of shipping. So I, I think a lot of people think that uh, there has been a, a, 
a, se a separation of people from the natural element that the ships uh, work in. And we see this tension played out in the uh, American Naval Academy, uh, where they threaten to get rid of learning how to navigate with a sextant, and then they go, oh, no, 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 that's a terrible idea. Um, and if you've been following the mishaps of the US Navy in Asian waters in the last couple of years, you'll realize that actually um, they need some help with their navigational skills. Uh, I'm struck by how navies still today all maintain one tall ship. You know, they, they, there is this sort of romantic attachment to having a sail ship. Even India, we have one tall ship. I mean, does it, does it actually have any relevance today to, to shipping today? I'm not sure it's only romantic, right? I think the aim is precisely to teach navigation on some sort of uh, sense of how this vessel is moving, which you can get a better feel for on a tall ship than you, a... You can certainly yeah. get a better feel for it. You're, you're much more exposed to the elements. You're aware of things like clouds and currents and winds. Uh, navigation is more difficult. But it, the simple steering of it is more difficult. So I think that there is... Um, a practical aspect to it, but at the same time, uh, there's also a sort of a public relations benefit uh, to have right. a ship that sort of stands out from the mass of other gray-hulled Navy ships worldwide. I also think it's worth noting that these are typically officers training vessels, right. and there's a kind of um, class yeah, element to it, I think. Definitely, yeah, definitely yeah. And on the, on the transition from sail to steam also, it's a, it's a great moment that had happened in other industries earlier and would happen in still others later of uh, de-skilling or reskilling, as right. the case may be, where you see this kind of erosion of, again, that artisanal class of laborers yeah. in favor of the sort of cogs in the machine, but also in favor of the engineers. And yeah. so now on board a ship, uh, the engineers will be really the critical personnel uh, on board a ship, and this is a whole sort of cadre of professionals who, of course, didn't didn't exist. So uh, when you were tra when you were traveling on on, on on the on the container ship, was there any sense of romanticism at all? Well, the captain on board my ship uh, was a person who had trained with a sextant, and he actually talked about how. Uh, he was put out at the fact that some of his junior officers didn't actually really know how to navigate, and he thought this was problematic because the instruments can break. And, yeah, right. uh, you know, you, you have these people... Um, I mean, the, the vast majority of accidents that happen at sea happen because people don't actually know what they're doing. Right. Uh, and and yes. it's, a, it's a real problem. And right. uh, it's a problem also now, I mean, when there is so much maritime traffic, right. uh, and you have people whose skill level at manipulating these large vessels is really patchy in, in certain areas. And so, you know, I think he was, he was quite concerned about the future uh, of this and keeps on telling me we're still in touch and he keeps on writing to me and saying, this is going to be my last voyage, this is going to be my <laughs> last voyage, because uh, he doesn't like the way it's going. Lincoln, is there any romanticism left in, 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 in shipping? Um, not or you'll argue there never really was romanticism in shipping. Well, I, I, think, I think there... I think that there are people who certainly go to sea with the idea of, um, you know, romance and adventure, um, mostly in sail training programs, whether they're state-run for navies or coast guards or for civilian use, um, and certainly individuals. There are lots of people, you know, countless people who sail around the world. Uh, they retire, buy a boat, go across the Pacific, or uh, whatever it is. Um, because it is romantic, because it is putting oneself in the most challenging situations and that kind of thing. But to sort of follow up um, and bring the, the, the sort of the romantic element that, that Conrad espouses up to the present, uh, there's a wonderful book by a woman named Barczewski about the Titanic. And she looks at the evolution of the way people in the public have perceived the Titanic since the ship sank 106 years ago up to basically the uh, Cameron movie about whatever that was, 15 or 20 years ago. And what's interesting is that in the old days, back when the ship actually sank, the thing that people really talked about was the heroics of the, the orchestra that played as the ship sank and uh, subsided beneath the waves. And then it went through some other um, manifestations until you get Cameron's movie where the hero, or not the hero, but the sort of the central figure is the engineer. And it's the engineer, and all of a sudden you've gone Oops. from this sort of Edwardian romanticism to the techno technocratic, you know, what is 
What is the problem we face if we rely on technology too much? Yeah. I, I think one of the problems with you know, maritime histories is that we tend to look for this sort of romance in, in, naval, in, naval, in navies and in cruise liners, but not really the merchant marine, you know, which is the sort of, you know, the, the part of, of, of maritime history that I, I, every, everyone overlooks, but it's actually what drives the maritime time world. And, you know, this is what I think is so fascinating about Conrad, because his life was spent in the merchant marine, not in the navy, not in a thing. And you do get that sense, right, of, 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 the, of, the, of the merchant marine, with all its ambiguities, capitalism at sea, uh, you know, really driving the world. Well, and if we can bring it back around to piracy, yeah. it is, of course, the merchant marine that is, is the target is of pirates, piracy, right? Even, and, even uh, today. Yes, and so uh, in Conrad's day, as today, the Straits of Malacca yeah. are one of the most uh, pirate-ridden zones uh, in the world because, of course, it's one of these choke points. You know, for all the things change in the world, the actual geography uh, right. or um, thassilography, whatever, hydrography, um, you know, has remained much the same. So there's this choke point there. Uh, and, uh, and, and it is these merchant mariners, particularly on the less well-funded ships that have fewer protections, that are lower, you know, lower down, closer to sea level, go slower, uh, that are the most vulnerable. So and, when, you, when uh, you were traveling on the, on the ship, what, was there talk of pirates? Yeah, so when I went, it was the end of 2013, and we went through the Suez Canal. So this was a period when there was still the Somali pirate threat in the Gulf of Aden, and there were uh, EU patrols uh, that were, uh, you know, patrolling the area, uh, and uh, you could request if you wanted some sort of convoy protection going through. Uh, the ship itself uh, had various anti-piracy measures, which involved uh, putting the fire hoses positioned. So what happens is the pirates would come in these little skiffs, and they come along, they can particularly get a, a much slower ship than right. ours was, but they can sort of come along the side. You don't see them necessarily very well. Right. Uh, and then they just throw up grappling hooks and they come up. So uh, so the fire hoses are basically to, to blow them down. The um, areas where they could have thrown up a grappling hook where there were sort of plastic things put over that. And then there was a bunch of um, bulletproof vests that were laid out. Now, many ships uh, have not been allowed for, I think, insurance reasons to carry weapons. Right. So you end up with this very vulnerable population of seamen um, who are on board these ships transporting huge amounts of cargo that's, that is worth much more to the insurers than they are themselves. Uh, and, uh, and yet they're given very little protection. So uh, anyway, so yes, I mean, there was this uh, sort of concern, uh, much less uh, kind of immediate for a ship like the one right. I was on. But now piracy has shifted largely over to the West African coast, uh, and it's there that I believe there's more uh, sailors in captivity right now than, than there are in Somalia. Yeah, although the trade in the west, of Af west coast of Africa is, is much less than there is in the Strait of Malacca. Yes, uh, but it's oil, uh, it's oil, oil based. Oil related, yeah. yeah. Um, and we were speaking earlier about how piracy tends to flourish in um, failed states. Yeah, and, and, and uh, I think that's yeah. what's interesting. I mean, that, 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 that Pirates don't come out of nowhere. I mean, pirates come out clearly, and this goes back to the history of, uh, if you look at the, the, the uh, ostensible reasons of, of you know, criminal regimes, uh, of you know, brutal uh, laws, or in, as you see now, uh, uh, broken states like, so, like, like Somalia, or in the case of West Africa, the effects of climate change, which is you know, drying up fisheries over there and driving a lot of desperate people into measures like piracy. Pirates don't come out of nowhere, but anti-piracy also doesn't come out of nowhere. And this brings us back to the Barbary Corsairs, which is that anti-piracy could often be used as a kind of leading edge for certain kinds of imperial uh, activity. You see this all over Southeast Asia, where anti-piracy becomes one of the banners under which uh, British and Dutch power extends itself. Right. And I would say that today there's a somewhat challenging position that I think uh, anti-piracy movements are placed under, which is that you have Somalia, it is a failed state, right. um, and you have these desperately poor people, poor people, and this is the only thing they can, they can really do, yeah. and then we kind of hold them up before international justice, yeah. and say, we hold them up before international justice and say, you're violating our codes, um, and yet, you know, how did they get to be in that position to begin with? So it's all a very complicated uh, situation, it seems to me, and ultimately perhaps the message of anything maritime is that everybody is connected. Yes, everybody is connected. 
Yeah, I mean, I, and when not you talk, always in a good way. So, sorry, yeah? Mm -hmm. no, sorry, you would say. Well, well the, the, you know, earlier at the beginning of this talk, we, we were talking about sort of distinctions between piracy and privateering, corsairing, uh, buccaneering. Um, and one of the things I think we forget is that, you know, you can look at criminal activity uh, and say, oh, that's so terrible, and then look at non criminal activity, like the Portuguese in India in the late. 15th, early 16th century, or all through the 16th century, and what they were doing was far worse than what any pirate it's, regime it's, it's, could possibly have yeah. done. Uh, they were instituting the Cartaz system, which basically said, in order to uh, be protected from us, you need a card. It was like, we didn't need a card before because you were not here. Right. And so they were basically, you know, making stuff up as they went along, as the Dutch then did in the 17th century in Southeast Asia, as the English and the Europeans and Americans did in China in the 19th century. I mean, it's the, the wielding the fort maritime power is an extremely, uh, can be an extremely lethal weapon. And, um, you know, and, if we, and that, if, that goes back to your, you know, that early statement of a pirate that you talk about, the exchange between the pirate and Alexander. I mean, in a sense, a question of who is a pirate really depends on who is powerful and who is the basic story is that, uh, that you know, a guy says, well, you, you call me a pirate because I'm just one person with one ship, but uh, Alexander the Great had, you know, hundreds of ships, and you don't call him a pirate, you call him an emperor. Yeah, and you know, I'm, when you were talking about weapons, I suddenly remember this one story, which is still running. I mean, it's a sad story, but uh, about, I don't know if you remember this, about seven or eight years back, there was an Italian ship which was uh, approaching the coast of Kerala, and there were these fishermen who, who were approaching it, and the, the ship had marines. The, this ship had marines for anti-piracy -pir measure, and the marines apparently thought the, the fishermen were pirates and ex opened fire on them and killed, uh, uh, killed a couple of fishermen. Now, this case has been going on. I mean, the, the, because they were so close to the, Ker the, the, the coast of Kerala, the Indian Coast Guard was able to, to uh, impound the ship and arrest the two marines, and this trial of the two marines has been going on like forever, and it's become a really sore point between Italy and, and India. And it's a fascinating example of how you know piracy can can still affect like like life to, life today, even though it's we think of it as a romantic issue of the past. Um, I, on that note, I think we can pretty much close in case anybody has any questions. Yes, there are a few questions. Sorry. Okay. Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, my name is Satyakam, and uh, I myself have been a chief engineer. I have sailed on uh, merchant vessels, uh, container ships, bulk carriers, and tankers. And uh, coming to your uh, uh, question, first of all, I was very impressed when you said that uh, engineers are the heart and soul of the ship. <laughs> Being an engineer myself, it really makes me happy. Uh, but the question is, uh, sir, that uh, piracy has uh, really uh, been a very major uh, focal point, especially in uh, the Gulf of Aden. But uh, now, the, and especially near the Strait uh, state of Hormuz and uh, like West Africa, yeah, we are saying. Uh, my question now is that uh, since I'm in the marine industry and uh, recently have been on an, uh, a case where uh, we are actually uh, thinking of uh, autonomous ships or uh, autonomous ships where there will be no manpower on board. Uh, so, as uh, ma'am, you have already stated that uh, the main reason why pirates are coming on board is because they can get some ransom. Uh, however, the cargo they carry is much more valuable. How do you think that the piracy would, uh, would be affected in this case if you have autonomous ships? Yeah, it looks good. Um, I think it's, it's viable, autonom autonomous ships. Really autonomous ships are viable. Uh, there's great political resistance to it uh, from basically people who are concerned about what happens to labor. I'm sure there are people who are already thinking about this very question that you're asking. I haven't read anything about it, and I have absolutely no idea how that would actually be dealt with. I imagine that uh, autonomous ships would start out on routes that were not necessarily susceptible to piracy. Uh, my did this question come up I, when you were on, on the container ship? Did people talk about autonomous ships? Were they worried? No, but I would say that, I mean, most ships, as you will know, are almost autonomous. I mean, that is, the number of people on board a ship is actually very, very, very low compared to the size of the ship. My guess would be that what you could do would be to have 
uh, pilots and a crew, you know, in and out of port, and then maybe a day out of port, take the crew off and have it do, as you say, the part that's not uh, piracy prone, you know, on the open sea, you know, that would be without crew. But uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know. It's a, it's a very small, the number of people actually employed, though, is, is very, very small. Um, yeah, the, 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 as the volume of shipping has increased since 1956 or whatever year it was, the containers first came online, um, the actual number of people employed in the shipping industry has shrunk. And you can see that the ratio of, I think, in the late 19th century, uh, on a, an American square rigger, you would have each crew, the, the tonnage to crew ratio would be 350, 400 tons per member of the crew. And, and now it's almost incalculable because, um, as I said, there are actual ships that can be run with far fewer people than they have, but the unions say, uh, for all sorts of reasons, not the least of which is the socialization issue, uh, we insist that you have at least 22 people or whatever it is, not the six you claim the ship can run with. Yeah, uh, that lady had a question. Sure. Sorry, just yeah. Can we have the last question, please? Yeah. Thank you. This is, you have said, uh, I mean, the theme is that the pirates were as organized as the MNCs. Could you give us some concrete examples of that? I mean, that's a slightly romantic notion, I think, pioneered by these <laughs> Pirates of the Caribbean film. But was it true? I mean, were there sort of pirate agreements and things like that? They were global. Pirates were global, are we, are we beyond the point, right? I mean, some of the English pirates did actually... I, I think that the, um, that the degree level of organization is a little bit overblown. Um, I think that there were pirate codes, you know, the same way that you have that with the mafia or organized crime of any kind. Obviously, there has to be some sort of structure uh, t to avoid complete anarchy, um, but I, I don't think that it was, it wasn't as organized as a, as a multinational corporation. But then look at, look at the multinational corporations. What was the East India Company doing? I mean, if you can look at it, if I want to strain the example a bit, the East India Company, and certainly in its early stages, was a vast pirate organization. Well, I think that here it might be helpful, and this is perhaps a good closing point, to yeah. think about what piracy signifies as a concept. I mean, we look at the world today and we see, uh, again, in line with this idea that we're all digital, et cetera, we see a, a, an internet economy that is driven by cables that are running on the sea floor alongside where the telegraph cables used to be. And we see internet, we surf the web, and we have internet piracy, right? So, right. so you know, I think that uh, the we have a, a, a suitably floating an unmoored concept here yeah. of piracy. Yes. Um, I think the idea of piracy as a criminal thing yeah. happening at sea is something that uh, in, in the specifics you'll find less of the East India Company but the, doing but the, than perhaps but the, cables, the cables still matter. The, That's a lovely well, point. Well, I was going to say, but the notion of a sort of, you know, some sort of upstart breaking into something established if we assume piracy to kind of mean that and doing it in an illicit way, you know, of course one can draw yes. the analogies everywhere. But I think that the analogy with piracy uh, in the internet era is a very, uh, very sort of interesting and suggestive one and tells us both how it is organized and how it is disorganized, yes. how our economy is connected and how vulnerable uh, it remains. Great, so like, well, lovely way to end with internet piracy. And as I said, uh, both our authors have separate sessions uh, tomorrow, uh, yours is, is, is tomorrow, so uh, please do make sure you attend the sessions to find out more about their books. Thank you so much. Thank you.